Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. My name is Cindy Brown. I'll be the moderator for today. But today's great presentation, I'm saying great because I love spiders, but I know that not everybody loves spiders. But I think after today, you're going to have a better appreciation and better understanding of who they really are. So, as always, we ask for you to put your questions in the chat box, and then I will share them with our speaker at the end of the presentation. Today's speaker is Dr. Sebastian Echeverria. Echeveri, I think I got it. You will have to correct me afterwards. But we are so glad that he joined with us today. He has received his doctorate on spiders. That's pretty amazing when you think about what you do and what level of understanding you have to have for this amazing animal to be able to complete it. So Sebastian, if you would take it away and I'll be back at the end of the program. But remember, put everyone put their questions in the chat box and we'll get to you at the end. I will see you in a bit. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Am I coming through? Yep. Perfect. Okay, I just want to double check that nothing's secretly muted. So as Cindy introduced me, hi, I'm Sebastian Echeverri. Um, I'm a PhD. I did my um, dissertation on how and why jumping spiders get their audience's attention when they're about to throw down some really cool dance moves. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about my favorite type of animal, spiders. Like these are... I live for these little guys and hopefully I can inspire some of that excitement and interest in all of you. Um, please, as I said, there's going to be lots of stuff that we'll learn. So questions, just put them in the chat whenever they come up and then at the end, we'll come back to them. I'm going to make sure that we have time to get to the, to your questions because those are really important too. Um, so I just want to start off with saying that I'm gonna talk about spiders. There's gonna be spiders in this talk about spiders. There's gonna be pictures of spiders. There's gonna be drawings of spiders and there will be one video of spiders. Uh, they're very cute spiders, I can promise that, uh, but they're gonna be there. Um, and I know for a lot of people, spiders are an animal that might be scary or startling or in some way, you might have some bad experiences with them that come up. Um, and I just wanna remind you to try to keep an open mind just like us, like a lot of us, these are animals that are misunderstood. Um, and if you have things that are that you find startling or scary or whatever, ask questions about them, because um, that's one of the best ways to um, sometimes overcome that fear, sometimes learn when it's rational to act on and so on. So please, let's let's get in a, in a mindset. Hopefully everyone that signed up for the talk on spiders is ready to learn about them, but I always want to make sure um, because they're, they're going to be there. So let's, with that in mind, with our hearts and minds in the right place to learn about really, really, really cool animals. There's a really basic question that I want to start with, which is like, what, what's a spider? Uh, <laughs> so spiders are these really cool animals that live all around us. This is a map from iNaturalist of observations of just spiders around the Washington DC metropolitan area. Um, there's 42,000 observations. So times people have seen a spider and been like, I wanna tell the internet that I saw a spider. Um, these animals are everywhere. Um, they are all across uh, the earth on every continent except Antarctica, except now they are in Antarctica because in the human research bases, there are spiders. There are, there are spiders adapted to human con uh, environments that are like in the like, research base in like a corner or something. So they made it everywhere. Um, and then every other continent they got to naturally, they live everywhere from underwater to on mountaintops. Um, but for a lot of us, and for me, for most of my life, you're probably used to seeing spiders here on like the logos of Spider-Man or in um, other franchises and characters on screen. And like, this is kind of what it was for me. I do want to emphasize that. I wasn't necessarily afraid of spiders as a kid, but like didn't know a lot about them, didn't think about them. I grew up in New York City in the same 
part of Queens as like Peter Parker in the comics. Um, and the most that I knew about spiders was, yeah, they, they filmed the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies like a few blocks that way. Um, that was kind of my connection to them. And then that's true for a lot of people. You know, we see them in things like Charlotte's Web and Lord of the Rings and the various Spider-Man logos. Um, and these are what people like, they, their experiences with spiders and maybe like, oh, you saw one at night and it startled you, right? Um, and one of the things I want to, to talk about today is like how that can change when you, and how much more there is to like get really excited about when you learn about the real animal. Um, so I want to take you to a moment that changed my life um, when I show, talk about what a real spider is like, because they're very different and we'll get into that a little more, but I'm gonna be showing you a video very similar to the one that got me to stand up in a room when I was applying for interviewing for grad school and be like, I need to learn more about this animal. I have no idea what's happening and I want to learn more. And so here is the courtship of a jumping spider. This is uh, a paradise spider. They live in the southwestern United States. And you can see a male here doing a song and dance coordinated song and dance. He's vibrating his abdomen to sing through the ground. He is doing dance moves to keep the female's attention, to show off different parts of his body, to show off these different super fast movements he can do in the hopes of uh, successfully mating with her. And I had never seen a spider like this before. And I think for many people that might be true. With the internet nowadays, it's a lot easier. Um, but at the time, this was eight years ago, I had never like seen these spiders are, are a speck and we'll, we'll get some visuals of that later. They're tiny. I had never seen something this close before and I needed to know more. Um, and that kind of brings me to like, okay, how is this the same thing that I saw on, you know, Spider-Man's shirt? What makes a spider a spider? What makes them special? All of these animals here are spiders. And you can see they're very different. Um, there's a lot of different ways that these animals have evolved to do a variety of things that we'll learn about today. And they're all really cool, but they're all, all these animals are tied together by their evolutionary history. And one of the really clear ways to see that is just how their bodies work. So let's learn a little bit about what makes a spider a spider um, by looking at just their bodies. It's a really great way to identify an animal and kind of group them together. This is what the first naturalist did once when people were starting to figure out these ideas of, of um, relatedness between different animals. And so we can kind of follow, follow that, that path. So for a lot of us, um, the, the, the idea of spiders having eight legs, which is true, is like this thing, one of the few things that we hear a lot about them but they actually have not just eight legs, they have arms or what I call arms, these pedipalps. So spiders actually have 10 limbs, just like you have two legs and two arms. They have eight legs for walking around and two pedipalps, which are like kind of like arms for like picking up stuff. Some species use them for walking. Um, and in uh, mature males, they're actually used as part of uh, reproduction. Um, to transfer uh, sperm from the, the male to the female. Um, and so that's already just the, the basic, what these animals look like is already different than you'll see because in a lot of cases, those pedipalps are not um, emphasized. Spiders' limbs are all attached to their head. So if you look at a spider and I've got a little model spider here, he's a toy spider too. All the legs come out of the bottom of their head including the pedipalp, so all their limbs are attached to their head. And the abdomen back here, which is that second round part of their body, spiders' bodies kind of look like the number eight. There's one ball in the front and one ball in the back. Um, and the abdomen, that's where almost all of their organs are. Their hearts are there, uh, their, lung is, their lungs are there, their reproductive organs are there. Um, a lot of their digestive system is there. The, the silk making stuff is all in there. Um, and it's actually kind of relatively soft, big sack of organs that they carry around on their weird head with legs. Um, and this is a real like spider. This is, you know, something that you might not have noticed zoomed up uh, until the animal zoomed up right in your face. 
Um, and now congratulations. Now that you've gotten to this part of the talk, you now know more about spiders uh, than the creators of Spider-Man. Uh, so now with your new knowledge of what a spider actually is, we can go back and look at the original logos for Spider-Man, the character, and you can see a couple of differences. Um, see how many you can spot, but I'll start pointing them out. If you look at the original 1962 logo, there's a couple things wrong there. Uh, we've got the eight legs, but they're on the wrong part of the body. There are no petty palps at all. So the spider has lost its arms. Um, and it takes 11 years of drawing this character based on a spider for the drawing on his chest to resemble a real life spider for the legs to have, like in 67, they've got the legs on the head, which is correct, but they lost two legs. 73 is when we get something. So already you can take this and just know that you are in the like top 50% of people in terms of knowing what a spider is. Um, and this kind of goes with a lot of, um, this kind of a trend. What we see about spiders in the media and in all the stuff that features them is usually pretty different from what the actual animal is. And you might think that, oh, that means that the animal's more boring or like it doesn't do all these cool things. No, 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 the real animal is like 500 times cooler. Um, and hopefully I can get that across to the rest of you. We're gonna get to a lot of cool things spiders can do. Um, and part of that is let's walk through their like the story of how they became what they are. So the story of where spiders came from. Um, because we learned about like, okay, this is what they look like, but like what kind of animal are they? Um, so like the vast majority of animals on earth, spiders are what we call arthropods. So what you're seeing here is an evolutionary tree, a diagram which represents which animals are more closely related to what other animals um, with arthropods highlighted in green right now. Um, and in fact, I'll just to, to, to give you a bit of a perspective, humans are in the group here called craniata. So things with like a cranium. Um, and those have about 65,000 species all put together. That's everything from like fish, lampreys, whales, all the way up to humans, everything. Everything that you're familiar with fits in there. Um, and they are like the third, fourth, maybe fifth most diverse group. It's somewhere in the like top five. The number one most diverse group in the entire world of animals is the arthropods with over um, 1 million species and counting. So the vast majority, 80% of all animals just everywhere are an arthropod, these types of animals, animals with exoskeletons and segmented bodies. Um, and some of the ones that you might be familiar with are insects. They're you know, bees, ants, things like that. Those are a common type of arthropod. Um, and spiders about the same size, they have an exoskeleton. Um, and while they're the same group as insects, they're actually really, really different. And part of the way we can see this is looking at how long it's been since they shared a common ancestor. Um, so at the top here, I've got just a list of different um, types of arthropods. They've all got their scientific names. So I'm gonna highlight spiders, the best one here. Um, and then insects all the way over there as you, the astute viewers will notice that insects are a subcategory of crustaceans. Um, they're just crustaceans that evolved to live on land. Um, that's what an insect is. Um, and on the, um, the kind of the, the x-axis here, uh, or I guess it's the y, um, I'm gonna be showing you like going into the past. So going down from the pages, millions of years in the past. Uh, we're gonna trace the, the, the family tree of these animals and see when were they like last related to get a sense of how similar they are. Are they like brothers, sisters, cousins, you know, cousins like a billion times removed? Let's see. So if we look at this family tree, we trace it back and 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 back. We can finally find where, um, oh yeah, here we go. Let's trace it back. The last time these animals shared any DNA, was around 550 or more million years ago. So before dinosaurs, before almost most prehistoric things that you can think of. Um, and to give you a sense of the context, you, everyone watching, are more closely related to sharks uh, than a spider is to an insect. 
spiders and insects are actually radically different types of life. Um, apart from sharing kind of the general idea of an exoskeleton and segmented legs, they've taken on really different paths in evolution and they've come up with their own adaptations that make them um, very different. Um, and as part of being such an ancient group of animals, um, you know, spiders have been around here, it looks like around 400-ish plus million years, um, or that's what we estimate. Um, fossils, the oldest fossils around 300 million years ago. Um, they've had the time to become incredibly diverse. So in the world, there are 5,500 species of mammals. Again, everything from mice to whales is in that 5,000. There's 50,000 species of spiders, 50,000 different takes on what a spider is, 50,000 different takes on what a spider web looks like. Everything from an orb web to a trap door to like a little lasso that you like sling out of the air and like snipe um, moths that are flying by. All of that is in there. Um, there are um, 50,000 different ways that spiders have eyes or don't have eyes, what they look like, how those eyes work, what they can see. Um, and um, that's actually one, one way that you can kind of identify a spider is by looking at its eyes and seeing how it sees. And another thing that, that um, to, to kind of, again, give you a sense of where these animals fit into the world is they're an arachnid, which is um, a word that's sometimes used as synonymous for spiders, but it actually includes a whole group of like really cool animals where most of them don't actually look like spiders. Like spiders are kind of the weirdos within arachnids. Um, everything from scorpions to, um, to mites and ticks, uh, tailless whip spiders, sun spiders, a lot of them have weird names, um, vinegaroons. Um, one of the most common ones that you'll see is the harvester or the apilionid. These are the daddy long legs. Um, and they look kind of similar to spiders. They've got the eight legs. They're kind of generally the same size sometimes. Um, but they're really different types of animals. Uh, spiders have fangs, pileonids don't. They act a little like food scissors, which is pretty normal for the rest of the arachnids. Um, and they, so they don't have that whole myth about, oh, them having the super strong venom. They don't have venom. In fact, most arachnids um, or don't have fangs, so they, they don't bite. The ones that eat, do have venom, like the scorpions, they don't, they don't bite them in. Um, they have the sting and apileonids don't have that. So one way to tell, again, is by looking at their body, spiders have that kind of hourglass or like number eight shaped body with a head and an abdomen. Well, apileonids are this, just this one big round ball um, that all the legs come out of. Um, and so this is kind of where they are in the world, but what, what makes them cool? What do these animals do that makes them awesome? Um, so the spiders are, when, in terms of the context of the ecosystem at large, this really important connection between big and small animals. And by small, I mean like smaller than like a centimeter or two. And by big, I mean bigger than like an inch or two. And most animals, that's kind of what small and big means. Like I said, most animals are arthropods. And so most animals are in that size range of like, they get to down to millimeter size up to like a few inches size in the world. Um, and spiders sit in this really cool place where they eat a lot of things, but they're also eaten by a lot of things. So spiders will eat most things that are their size or smaller. Um, they are catching prey out of the air. They're catching prey by hunting it on the ground. They are actually one of the reasons that um, there's just kind of like leaves on stuff because they're one of the the controls on uh, plant eating insects. So plant eating insects around the world love to eat on plants, um, but because there are enough predators that we still have trees that aren't always damaged by, um, by, by uh, feeding. Um, and spiders do eat each other. So they also control their own populations because uh, a spider will eat pretty much anything. Like I said, around its size or smaller. Um, and for the most part, they do not make any real distinctions. Um, and for many animals, like many animals that we want to keep around, spiders are a core piece of meat of, of their diet. They're these little 
easy to catch because spiders tend to not be very armored. Um, they tend to, especially um, things this small, their venom tends to not really do much to an animal that's like 10 times bigger than them. Um, and then there's just these balls of delicious protein. Um, for a lot of songbirds, this is part of their diet for the nesting season. Like they need this in order to get food, um, in order to reproduce successfully, in order to grow, um, in order to feed their offspring. Like spiders are, are, because there's so many of them, because they're everywhere, for so many animals, they are like this, this um, central part of their livelihood. Um, and then for some animals, like their lives kind of revolve around the things that spiders make. So this is one of my favorite examples of um, hummingbirds, which use spider webs to literally like make their homes, their nests, um, where they're taking leftover spider webs and um, weaving them together as like a cool form of natural recycling. Um, and speaking of that silk, I mean, it's this material that spiders are making just like all the time. It's just what they do. It's one of the things that makes spiders spiders is making silk out of spinnerets on their abdomen. Um, it's stronger than steel. It's one of the strongest materials we've ever found in terms of how much energy it takes to pull it apart. Um, and we still struggle to make anything this strong or to make silk as easily as a spider does. Even with like genetic engineering, we're still just like trying to get back to what a spider just kind of like does without thinking about it. Um, spiders can even be a way to learn about our environment. So in your garden, in across your neighborhood, there are spiders, they're living there. Um, and you can look at what, at what they're there because they are like this link in the ecosystem. You can look at the spiders to learn about the populations of animals that eat them and the ones that are eaten by them, right? They, they're this bio indicator of what's going on in the ecosystem. But they can even tell us about things like air quality. So this is a grass spider. Um, in a lot of parts of the United States, they're everywhere. They build webs on like everything except grass, um, <laughs> hedges, houses, fences, whatever. Um, but if you look in one of these things, what these webs are doing, they're collecting air samples at really hyper local um, locations and they're collecting dust particles. Um, and there's actually a scientist out there um, who's collecting these webs as a way to measure air pollution in different parts of cities because the spiders are everywhere. And so you can use them as, as part of your experience, as part of a way to learn about thing, our own lives, how we're affecting the world. Um, the more, the closer you look to the spiders, the more there is to get excited and inspired by. And I mean, that there's a reason that Spider-Man is one of the world's most um, popular superheroes. And there's a lot of stuff that's like about the writing of the, the hero, but part of it is, is this inspiration of something that everyone dislikes, like a spider, and turning that into a, like this underdog story of someone who may not be super popular, may not be super like perfect, but is trying to do their best. Um, and for me, that's a big inspiration in my life. Um, I'm a huge fan of the, of, of Spider-Man, especially the, the Spider-Verse movies where you're thinking about how the diversity of these animals can, whatever way that you approach it, it's, it brings something unique to the table, right? And like, I think that's a really cool message that spiders can teach us every day. Um, and that brings me to one of my, um, one of the things that I really want to talk about is like, what can our relationships day to day with a spider be like? Um, for me, there's something that get me excited to go basically anywhere because almost anywhere I go in the world, I can find a spider that I've never found before. And like that in itself is like, there's, there's this feeling of like, oh yeah, there's like, we kind of know what's going on in the natural world. Um, and for a lot of animals, we might not know everything they're doing, but we've at least found most of the species. We, we you know, we generally know something about them. There are spiders that are being discovered every day. And it's not necessarily like in a part of the world where it's hard to get to, et cetera. Um, they're being found everywhere. Like you just, we literally just need to look closer at animals, you know, down in the local park. Um, and that's super exciting to me. The fact that there's this feeling of discovery that's still out there when I'm paying attention to animals on this scale. 
is really fun. Um, but for a lot of us, the first thing that might come to mind is, are these animals dangerous? Do I have to worry about a spider if I'm if it's near me, if it's in my house? And I just want to try to flip that from the perspective of the animal, because that'll help us understand what it's going to do and what it's not going to do. Because animals are here because they've evolved to survive long enough to make it to the present time. Um, and their behaviors are the result of selection for behaviors that generally keep them alive longer. So spiders are fragile and very small. So this is a jumping spider. This is one of the species I studied for my PhD. Um, and that's on my finger right there. That animal is about, you can measure the length of this animal in ridges of my fingerprint. Um, and for many spiders, that's true. There are spiders that get a little bit larger, um, but even for the largest spider in the world, um, which gets to be about, I don't know, 11 to 12 inches in leg span, that's not their actual body, just if you stretched out their legs, um, you are still 10 to a dozen times bigger than them. Again, that is you looking at a building um, that's kind of the scale difference between these animals and us. And of course, spiders have venom, which is like a thing that might even the scales, right? But what do spiders use their venom for? They use their venom to catch food. That's the main thing that it has evolved towards, a way for them to feed themselves. Um, and that means that that venom's evolved to use, to work on, um, on the animals that they eat. So venom, just like anything that goes inside a body and like affects how those cells work, just like medicine, um, it depends on how that animal's bodies work, how that animal bodies, how that animal's body works, changes how well the venom affects it, right? Um, just like how you, there are medications that you would give to your dog, but not to yourself, um, or they might have wholly different effects on you and your dog, um, just like you can eat chocolate, but your dog should not. Um, venom works, it's a same principle. Um, and so most spiders in the world, uh, and over 99% of all the species that we have in North America, their venom doesn't really work on humans. Um, their venom has evolved to eat arthropods, which if you recall the, the family tree from the beginning of the talk are really, 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 really distantly related from us. Um, it's so far back in time that it's really hard to estimate it, but it's like anywhere between 600 to 800 million years ago is the last time we were related to arthropods. Um, and so our bodies are radically different. And so the way that the proteins and the venom affect our bodies often are radically different. There are only very few spiders that have venom that's, that has evolved to work on vertebrates particularly well. Um, and the ones that, the only ones that you ever need to worry about in any sense are, at least in North America, are uh, the brown recluse and the widow spiders. Um, brown recluses are only in certain parts of the country. Outside of that, they're just not around. Widow spiders are kind of distributed throughout the um, the kind of southern or, you know, colder or warmer parts of, of uh, North America um, and down into Mexico. And yes, those animals can have venom strong enough to cause uh, a doctor's visit. We call it medically significant. It's not a venom that actually has resulted in a death in a very, 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 very long time. There haven't been any reported deaths in like several decades. Because uh, if you go to the doctor, you'll get treated. Um, and then you'll be fine for the most part. Um, you might have like a scar. Um, um, but again, these, like to give you a sense of, of even with these animals, venom strong enough to hurt humans, these, these are things that the spider knows can't save its life, right? Because this is like you facing down a skyscraper with like a sledgehammer. Yes, sledgehammers are good against buildings, but um, it's still a skyscraper. So even if you hurt it a little bit, you're still going to be the one that doesn't get out of that situation. And the animal's behavior tells us that. 
So there's this really cool study about how hard it is to get bit by a black widow spider. So basically what the researchers did is they took a black widow spider and they continuously bothered it and put it in more and more threatening circumstances to see what it would take for that animal to get upset and actually bite with its super medically significant venom. Um, and I just wanna highlight here, that's the bite percentage. What percent of the time does a spider bite? It takes up to high threat, which in this environment was the researchers holding the spiders like this between two fake fingers and literally squishing it, like imminently threatening the spider with death for 60% of the spiders to decide to bite. In all other cases and in everything before that, their response was to try to leave, play dead, just be like, hey, leave me alone. Um, and this is because these animals have evolved to survive. Um, they've been around for 300 million years at least. They've survived multiple mass extinctions um, and they learned and evolved to survive um, uh, by hiding from people. Um, spiders that bit people got slapped and, um, or bit that bit large animals got slapped and squished. Spiders that, like this tarantula, curled up in a ball. So this is what tarantulas do when they're scared. Um, they will cover their face with their legs and try to pretend that the world doesn't exist because they can't see the world and the world doesn't see them. Um, this is what most tarantulas, um, especially the North American ones, will do um, if they're threatened. They'll try to leave or do this or just like kick itchy hairs at you um, before even trying to bite. Um, and so these are animals, if you think from their perspective, their best response is to just like get out of there and go on with their life. And that's what they wanna do. Um, and that's what they're going to do if given the opportunity. Spider bites do happen and they often happen in cases where we don't realize the spider is there and we're putting it in a situation where it thinks it's about to die. Um, and even then we're always gonna be the kind of the, the, the winner, the survivor in that situation. So when you see a spider, I want, Think about your, yourself looking at a skyscraper and say, what would I do? And what would I want a skyscraper to do, a walking skyscraper to do when it was, you know, when it spotted me? Um, trying to give yourself an ability to understand the spider's world. And so I'm going to, um, we've got 30 minutes left. Okay, so I've got some time. This is the part where I really wanted to ask you to imagine something that's different from your own life because these are animals that are doing things that are, when I learned about them, they changed my idea of what these animals could do. Uh, what an animal, even just an animal could do. So again, let's take a journey into a spider's world through just uh, some really cool examples that got me excited. Again, 50,000 types of spiders. Um, so I'm not gonna cover even any real fraction of what their lives are like. But I want you to just like, let your mind travel on this one. Um, I want you to look, imagine what it takes to build a web. Imagine building a building, right? But you can't actually see far enough to, from one end of your building to the other. You don't actually have a, a way of like, telling where the rest of the foundation is. And yet spiders do this. Some of them do it every single night. They'll rebuild their web. They literally cannot see far enough to look at that other anchor point. And they're creating these structures. They're doing them often at night. Um, they're doing them without getting caught. They are doing them in often ways that adapt to their local environment. So they're changing the shape of their web in some species. They're changing the entire composition of it in others. And then there are spiders that, that say, no, I don't need to make my own web. The water is my web. Imagine you're out at night and you're just, you've just got your hands out on top of the lake and you're waiting and you're feeling the vibrations in the water. And as a fish swims by, you just shove your face in, grab it in your teeth and yank it out. And that is how you live every day of your life. That's a fishing spider. There are spiders that, that say, no, nope, not going out. I am staying at home forever. I'm going to live completely unseen. Um, I'm going to make my web into just camouflage. And I will only emerge 
I will only stick my fangs out to catch food and then I'm staying inside. That's purse web spiders. They have been doing that for millions of years and they're great at it. You would never even know one existed unless you knew exactly what to look for. There's where I say, no, I'm, it's too much stuff going on on land. I'm gonna go live underwater. I'm gonna take a bubble of air. I'm gonna grab it, wrap it in some silk, bring it down, tie it to the stem of a water, of an underwater plant. And I'm gonna make just, a, just an underwater dome where I live. And whenever I need to go out and do something, you know, put some of that, uh, trap some of that air on my abdomen with these special hairs and just go out and my entire life is underwater. Air, I, I got plenty. Surface, no, too much going on up there. Diving whale spider. They're all across the world, um, especially in Europe and Asia. Uh, that Their entire lives underwater. Um, there's where I say, oh, too wet. I'm going to go to the desert and I'm gonna build elaborate tunnels under the sand. Um, if you've ever tried to build like a sand castle out of like dry sand, maybe you, this gives you a sense of the accomplishment that they're doing their entire lives just under the desert sand, sweltering temperatures. And that's what they do. There are spiders that say, you know what? Web's fine, whatever. Look, I, just wanna, I just wanna get this food really fast. I'm gonna do make one of the fastest movements of any animal in the world. I'm gonna snap my jaws shut. This is at, um, I believe, 5,000 or 10,000 frames per second. I forget what she, um, Hannah, Dr. Wood recorded this at. Um, this is a trap show spider. There's one of the fastest movements ever by any animal that we know of. That's just what a spider does every day. That's its livelihood. There are spiders that say, you know what, hunting, mm, no. I'm going to go to this tree that has evolved to make food for ants that live on the tree that protect the tree from invaders like myself. And I'm going to hide on this tree for my entire life, always on the run from ants, but I'm gonna steal the food that this tree has evolved to produce. And that's my diet. Um, this is a like 80% vegetarian spider. It only rarely eats um, other animals. Almost all of its diet is vegetarian. One of the few spiders in the world that's like that, but they've evolved this unique way of life. Their spider would say, you know what? I need to travel. I'm going to use my silk, not to build a web, but to fly. I'm gonna turn it into like this giant hot air balloon and just go. I'm gonna use the wind. I'm gonna use Earth's electromagnetic field um, to just lift me off into the air. And I'm gonna literally fly across the ocean. There are spiders um, that if you look at their evolutionary history, they would they'd evolve in one part of the world and they'd actually arrive um, to another continent while there was no like land connection. And it's because they literally like flew across the Atlantic Ocean and then were like, oh, hey, um, this place seems cool. There, it, these animals are doing things and they, I mean, they, they do this as babies. So it's like, imagine flying across the Atlantic Ocean, like, I don't know, a, a few weeks after you're born. Um, these animals' lives are complicated. They are a lot more than just, for many species, they're a lot more than just lay eggs and walk away. There are jumping spiders that raise their families. This is a, a female that you can see in the background, and she produces milk for her offspring, which are the babies in the front. Um, and they live with her until they grow up and move out of the house. Um, they have these extended family relationships. There are spiders that literally give their own lives for their families. This is a, a black lace weaver. And so what the females will do is um, they will actually sacrifice themselves to be their offspring's first meal, because that means that all those offspring can then molt, and then they are already larger and stronger for when they leave the nest. And that is, that is what she has evolved to do. This is what all the females do. This is part of their way of life. There are spiders that while a lot of them are, are loners, there are spiders that have evolved to work together. There are social spiders that, have, that has evolved, that actually has evolved in multiple branches of their family, but they'll build these like giant, like communal spider webs where they all live together. They like all share kind of the defense, the 
catching prey, the raising of the offspring, like it's this, this interwoven community of animals. Um, and that's their life. You know, there are spiders that work together with other species. So there are a lot of tarantulas actually that have been documented allowing um, small frogs to live in their burrows um, while chasing off and eating bigger things. And the, the idea is that these frogs might actually be protecting the spider's eggs and, and babies from um, parasites because one of the biggest fears of, of spiders are parasitic wasps and um, other parasitic insects. And so these are animals that would normally be predator and prey, uh, either the, the toad eating the baby spiders, the adult tarantula eating the tiny little toad, and yet they have evolved to work together. Um, there are spiders that have evolved to not be spiders. This is a jumping spider. It is not an ant. Um, this is actually an incredibly common thing across spiders is this idea of mimicking an ant. And they've evolved to look just like an ant. They've evolved to look, to use their arms as fake antenna and they walk around literally their entire lives pretending to be something that is 500 plus million years unrelated to them. Um, and that's how they survive. Because if you look like an ant, things think you're an ant and larger things don't want to eat you because ants are kind of gnarly prey. Uh, but that's their life. And they also have to like balance that with when they want to mate with another of their own species, be like, oh, no, wait, I'm not actually an ant. I'm not, I'm a jumping spider. I'm a jumping spider. I'm not an ant. Um, living in disguise every day and then just suddenly being like, whoop. Nope, that's not me. Um, and they're not the only ones. There are animals that say, ah, wait, you're not the jumping spider, I'm the jumping spider. Um, animals that take the traits of spiders and use them to protect themselves from spiders often. Um, there are spiders that just blend in. There are animals that have evolved in these habitats where you might not ever see them unless you start looking close. Um, and then there are spiders that you cannot look away from because they are so colorful and beautiful that you're like, that's, that's a real, that's a real ant like that. Yeah. They, that's what they look like all the time. Um, and why we don't know yet. Um, that's actually a really, really fascinating thing. And of course the spider world isn't just beautiful. It is scary. You know, spiders live in a world where brain controlling parasites are very much a real thing that you have to worry about. So if you see here, this is a, a larva of a, a wasp that is uh, latched onto the spider. It is feeding off of it, um, but it is also affecting its behavior. And it will later tell that spider, build me a cocoon so that I can finish eating you so that I can then metamorphose into an adult wasp. Um, and these are things that these animals have had to like that, that's their fear. Zombies are a thing for them. You know, it's not just a story. It's, it's like one of the biggest predators of spiders are these wasps. Um, and then there are spiders that live in places where we don't think life can exist. Um, and I'll end with one of my favorites, which is the Himalayan jumping spider. Um, it lives, uh, the way I've, I've liked to think about it is it is the animal that is on average closest to space um, of any other animal. Because most humans, yeah, there's, a, there's like a couple dozen humans in space, you know, any given time. Um, and then the like other 8 billion of us are here on, on the ground. Uh, this animal has been found 22,000 feet above sea level on Mount, literally on Mount Everest. And like, there's just populations of them that just live up there. And that's, the environment that they live in, that's the climate that they're adapted to. How? I wish we, <laughs> we had the resources to go and find out more about them. Um, because I bet there's a lot we could learn about how you take an animal that is cold-blooded. I mean, the, they're exothermic, they get their heat from the environment. How are they surviving basically at the altitude where a lot of humans have to wear tons of gear and like oxygen masks? There's a lot to learn from these spiders. And if there's anything that I want you to do is the next time you see a spider, try to imagine what their life is like. Try to imagine the world that they're living in, even if for just a second. 
um, and watch them, see what they're doing, see how they're exploring your garden, um, your yard, your house even. Um, I have a lot that, so let's see. Yeah, we've got 15 minutes. Let's, I'm gonna do a quick recap and then we'll go to questions because I'm sure you've got a lot of them. So we learned there's a bunch of spiders in the world. They'd come in every shape and color and they do basically every version of what being a spider is. There's a spider out there that does that. Oh, there's a spider that lives like in coral, like 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 in um in like a coral reef. It like makes a little trapdoor in one of the coral that's like kind of like just in the intertidal zone. And it spends most of it like half of the day underwater in salt water, like hold up. And then it comes out when the tide goes out. That's just like a cool thing that a spider does. Um, that's just like one of them. Um, they have um, 10 limbs, eight legs, two arms, and all of those are attached to their head where most of their organs are in their abdomen. Um, so if you remember the numbers eight and 10, that'll tell you a lot about spiders um, and help you draw them if you'd like. They're a type of arachnid, which is a really diverse group of animals. Um, that includes scorpions and ticks and harvesters or damning long legs. Um, they are harmless to us, like the vast majority of spiders that you see, um, you can approach and interact with without fear, um, or at least with the knowledge that even if you are afraid, the spider cannot hurt you. Um, if they're an animal that you're worried about, you can pretty easily, like if you see one in your house, moving them around and putting them outside is totally fine. And that's a great way um, if there's something that, you, that you're uncomfortable, if, if you're uncomfortable with them in your space, this is the most ethical thing you can do. Um, and there are a lot of ways to learn more about them. Um, I would really wanna highlight the book, Spiders of the World, uh, cause it's this really fun, it's very family friendly, lots of pictures. And it goes through basically every genre of spider, every family within the group of spiders. Um, and there are ones in here that are just like, like I didn't even touch on, on like half of the cool things in here. There's no time. Um, that and amazing arachnids are also great. And you can always ask me uh, on social media. One way that a lot of people have been able to find like a positive connection. Um, and for a lot of people this has helped get through their fear is photographing them like you would a bird, like you would a flower. Um, if you're interested, I did a, a, a workshop on taking pictures of spiders with your smartphone and like whatever you have lying around the house. It's on YouTube um, and you can search for it there. Um, I also designed a course called Crash Course Zoology, um, which did a lot of cool stuff for us about spiders and a bunch of other animals that you can also find and check out. Um, and if you enjoyed this experience and you would like me to talk about cool animals at some other place, at some other event, TV show, podcast, you know someone who's like, hey, I, I wanna learn about spiders. Um, or you need like really cool photos of like very small animals, uh, please get in touch because that's what I do and I'd love to do more of it. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take all of your questions. Um, yeah, please, let's do it. Sebastian, I think you've changed a lot of people's minds. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been reading everybody's comments and they are, so engaged with what you're teaching them and the look Wonderful. at a spider's life. That's cool. They're cool. We can't be, I still, I have a black widow family or at least one in my, my shed. I leave her alone, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to kill her, but yeah, I still stay away from her. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that's all she wants. Like that, that's what that hourglass, that coloration says, just, just like, please leave me alone. I'm going to hang out over there mm -hmm. and just like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, you know, that's what they want to do. That's perfect. Well, we're not going to get to all these, but let me look at some of them. Uh, they want to know either how can they attract them to their garden or how mm -hmm. can they get them out of their basement? Is there sure. a, a, a way to attract or deep get rid of spiders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are both great questions. So um, in terms of bringing where, okay, so spiders go where the food is and where it's not harmful for them, where the environment's good. So you want to do that you use that information in both ways. Um, to get them out of your house, um, most of the time, if spiders are, if you see a lot of spiders in your house, they are, have either gotten in there by accident and they would like to be placed outside. Um, there is food in your house, which means that there's like flies and stuff and cockroaches that are just like yum, 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 yum. They're taking care of that for you. <laughs> um, you can choose to move the spider. 
Um, but the bugs, unless you take care of the bug, the like the food problem, the spider, like they may come back or you'll just have a different problem. Um, um, and those are kind of the two reasons that they, they get inside. There are a few spiders that are just like evolved to live in like human affected areas, mm -hmm. like cellar spiders that survive a lot better inside than outside. But if you put them just like, even if you like don't want them in the room, but you just put them like on your porch or something, they'll be fine. Um, so moving them outside and controlling like um, gaps in your house, to let them get in as well as food for them inside. And then the garden, it's the other side. It's the other mm -hmm. like flip of this. You want to avoid things like pesticides because that's going to be affecting these animals too. Um, you're going to want to create gardens that invite a lot that have like natural plants, native plants, because that's going to bring um, native insects and that's food for the spiders. And they're going to move in. The other huge thing is you need to have a space in your garden um, where these animals can survive over the winter um, because in a lot of clay, in a lot of cases, that's leaf litter. So, you know, dead leaves on the ground um, or, you know, dead plants on the ground. The spiders will, at the end of the season, you can actually, this is what I think I do at the end of the season. I just go and look in like curled up leaves and I find a bunch of spiders. That's where they're going to sleep out the winter. Um, and so if you take all of that and you mulch it and you, uh, you like grind it up or you, you throw it away, you're basically wiping out your spider population every winter. Um, and that is not only bad, just like in the short term, um, but it is bad for like the ecosystem in the long term. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of declines in arthropod populations that are related to that. So even if it's just part of your yard, leave like a pile of leaves, they will stay out through the winter. They'll like decay throughout the winter. And then the animals will come out later and you can kind of get rid of them in the spring if you'd like, even though for some species, that's their year round habitat. Um, and there's some really cool leaf litter species, but like pseudoscorpions love leaf litter too. But anyway, that okay. those are the, the kind of the two ways. That's very cool. And and we do promote that at Smithsonian Gardens that Perfect. leave the leaf litter, make your habitat yeah. friendly. And it's not just good for the spiders, it's good for all kinds of insects and little critters that are running around. So leave that and then be very careful of how you clean it up then in the spring. Um, our parterre is always gonna be spotless, but the rest of our gardens, we really mm -hmm. do try to uh, leave room for the, the habitat uh, animals that keep everything else. All right, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this one insect or this one spider, mm -hmm. but phyllocidae, phyllocidae, they have them in their basement and th they weren't oh, yeah, aware uh, that they had um, any food. Yeah, yeah, those are the cellar spiders. Um, oh God, it's like flo flocus, flo flo I, for I forget what the actual, yeah, but it it's the cellar spiders. Um, those are one of the spiders that are adapted in human areas. They don't need to eat too much. If they've set up a web down there, they're probably catching something. Um, you can watch, one of the cool things is you can watch them and when they have something, they'll be, you know, they'll, it'll be stuck up in the web there. Um, but it might just be like an occasional like mosquito that gets in there. And especially in the winter, a lot of them just like kind of sleep it out. And then in the summer when there's more stuff active, they'll eat a bunch. Um, so yeah, full, uh, Flossidae? I keep I, forgetting I'll, if the I'll L is P H P H I C P H O L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I forget oh, where yeah. the L goes. Um, but yeah, cellar spiders. If they're there, they're probably doing fine. Okay. Well, they they don't particularly want them there, but it does sound like if there's food, even if there's a minimum amount of food, and the spiders have found it, they're going to stay unless you eliminate all the food. Yeah. But how or you, you can move them outside. Everything? That that's an option. I would wait until it's warm enough just to give them a chance out there, but. That is also an option that it's totally that's... understandable. I get it. Like there are animals that I think are really cool that I wouldn't necessarily want inside my house. Um, <laughs> and that's totally fine to do. Okay. Are spiders like other insects declining in population? Um, that's one of the things that we, I like don't fully know. So one of the saddest things about um, spiders is that there's been such little research on them compared to how diverse they are and how important they are. Um, there are like maybe like two spiders or maybe, no, I think it's like more, it's like four. Worldwide, it's like maybe like 10 on like the, that have been looked at for endangered species protection. Um, but there are spiders that are definitely like rarer um, based on the people who study them not being able to find them and often, but there isn't the funding because a lot of the times it's hard to get funding to be like, I want to go find this, like, count the number of this spider. 
um, to do the whole process to like be sure that we need to, to, to go through like the whole certification. In general, if their food source is going down, which insect declines have been reported, mm -hmm. then they by like they're gonna not have enough food and their all their populations are also gonna drop. But is it is this like really sad lack gap in knowledge that I really hope is a change that we have in our culture of like appreciating these animals and like studying them. Um, because we do need to protect them. There are so many that we don't know about yet um, that could be you know, world like like life changing in terms of like the stuff we learn, the technology that we can build from their venom, from their silk, from the, just other parts of their body. Like we learn about how their body works that could just go extinct before we find them, yeah. and like that's a little scary to me. So we need to encourage more little entomologists. Yes, uh, to please get out there and and learn more about spiders. So if you know and it's easy. That that's job. the cool yeah. thing. Like. <laughs> No matter where you are listening to this, I can guarantee that when it's a little warmer, you can step outside and within like, I'll, I'll be generous and I'll say like three yards of the perimeter of your house, you can find a spider. Like it is not something that you need to travel for. It is not something that you need to budget for. It is an animal that you can like go and like really learn a lot about anywhere. Um, you know, the, the lenses that I use to take a lot of my photos, you saw some photos in this talk that were taken with a lens like this. This is like $30. There are ones that are like 10. Um, and that's all you need to get started. That and like some sort of camera. It can even be an old camera, like an old point and shoot. You can really get a lot out of that. Um, and so there's a super accessible way for anyone to learn about nature, learn about evolution, learn about animal behavior, wherever they are. And that's one of my favorite things about them too encouraging so how long do they live the someone asked if could they really live to be 10 years old oh yeah and how, yeah oh and so it depends on the type of spider um there's a again the, the theme of the talk is diversity um there are spiders that live like several months to maybe a year that's relatively common for what we call typical spiders so things like orb weavers you see jumping spiders are anywhere between like one to sometimes four if they're older um a four is like really old for these species in, in terms of my experience again not a lot of research on this this is a lot of personal experience um but there are um some types of spiders that are super long lived so tarantulas and other tarantula like spiders which are in the, the group called the mygalomorphs um they can live a really long time so the world record that we know about is a spider that lived to be 43 and it did not die of old age. It only died because it was um, parasitized by a wasp. I read a about that one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it was out in the news. It's yep. a really, really touching story. I would like very much recommend people to check it out. Um, just look for like oldest spider in the world um, and you'll find a bunch of really beautiful stories about it because th there's a, it's one person who literally saw this spider every year for its entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something magical when you have a connection with an animal that entire time. Um, but yeah, that's like, that's the oldest that we know of. It could have lived longer. There are tarantulas in, that, that are commonly kept in captivity where females can live, you know, 30 years. Males tend to live less. They tend to grow up faster, reach sexual maturity, and then they spend the, that sexual ma short maturity going to look for females, and then they do not molt again and they pass away. Um, so their lifespan is usually a lot less than females, typically. Um, but yeah, it, it's a huge range from a year to 40 plus. Mm -hmm. All right. We have one minute. Can you tell us in one minute, yes. how do they make those webs? Yeah, if okay. They can see, how, how do they do that? Yeah. Um, uh, the general answer is you use the silk as your memory of where you've been. So my understanding, and I'm not someone who studies web building behavior, is that they, they start, they climb up somewhere, they anchor their silk, um, and then some of them, I believe, um, will climb down and they just climb up again. And then now that they've, they, and holding one end of the silk to where they were, and then the other end attached to their spinneret. And so now they have a line from one side to the other that they can walk across. And then from there, you generally repeat the process again to get the rest of your anchor points and you use the like physical memory of the silk as your spatial awareness okay. um, and then you fill in the the pattern 
is like a very one minute version of it. Very cool. Well, we know that these programs that we offer aren't going to tell us everything. <laughs> They're going to excite you about learning yeah. more. And there are so many good resources out there. We mm -hmm. will put this webinar as we do all our webinars as videos on our Let's Talk Gardens video library. And uh, Sebastian has shared some resources with us that we will also put up on that. It takes us a while. We have to do the editing of the closed captioning, but please look for our videos on Smithsonian Gardens website, gardens.si.edu, as Zach puts them in the box. And thank you, Zach, for keeping us up to date with all the resources, but we'll include everything. But this is just the beginning of your journey. Yes. Go out and look, see yes. what you've got. Don't Find a cool spray spider. insecticides. That's a good rule for <laughs> any type of gardening. Leave those alone. Be a more diverse gardener. Thank you, Sebastian. That was Thank you so much for having me. This terrific. was a lot of fun. And anyone, um, I just put in my Twitter in on um, in the chat, but um, you can feel free to ask me more questions about spiders. I'm online. Uh, my website is spiderdaynightlive.com, and that'll get you to everywhere where I am on the web. Um, I want to hear about cool spiders you see. I want to hear about spider okay. questions you have. Um, okay. So please be in touch. All right. Thank you. We will. And we really appreciate it. Thank you to Zach and thank you to Sebastian. What a great presentation. See you all later. Bye-bye.